Hello, good evening, or maybe late afternoon. I don't know where you are and what time zone you're in, but I'd like to comment on a few of the aspects of the last session, which covered sort of changes in pottery making. And my comments are going to be eclectic and they're not going to cover everything. I don't have enough time for that. So let's begin. Right, there we are. So as I said, I have just sort of assembled a few points that I thought were interesting because a complete summary of all these very, very interesting papers is just not possible. And of course, I based myself on the papers that I've read but also I've included some of my personal interests in all of this. And because I couldn't attend all the other sessions, I am really focusing only on what is being happening uh, this afternoon. So first of all, I want to accentuate the importance of true transdisciplinarity. We cannot understand the ceramics of any period unless we combine ethnography, archaeology, knowledge of the technology, and experiments. Le Roi Gourand gave the first sort of impetus on that because he combined ethnography and archaeology and came up with very interesting and worthwhile theories on the interaction between people and materials, what builds their traditions, what is the actual change mechanism, and so on and so forth. Another person on whom I have drawn very heavily was my teacher in the United States, Raymond Thompson, who looked in detail at the potential of interaction between ethnography and archeology, span looking at really very specific aspects of the pottery making. That has been published as a memoir of the Society of American Antiquity. I think what is really sort of my impression of a lot of the work that is going on, and again, I have not seen most of the papers that have been presented in this seminar, but is the necessary intimate knowledge of the challenges and affordances of the pottery making system. I have rarely yet encountered real descriptions of those challenges and how they are actually being met. And then finally, the wave of experimental archaeology in the 60s and 70s, which was all over the place, uh, bypassed ceramic studies. Experiments have been confined to effectively the uh, highly scientific raw materials studies and have not really gone wider than that. And so it seems to me that the last two things are absolutely fundamental for a good chaîne opératoire reconstruction. So a next point is the need to homogenize terminologies. In the papers, and that is also common in a lot of the literature, we have not really arrived at good descriptions that are accepted by everybody. And so we need to build those and we, they need to be referring to measurable characteristics, such as the construction of the wheel, for example, the weight of the wheel, its momentum and where the weight is spread, which dictates the momentum, the speed and the vari variability for control, uh, then the time to shape standard sized vessels, shaping techniques used, etc., etc., etc. One of the very interesting attempts that I have seen of that is Balfe and Fauvet's multi-language dictionary of ceramics. And I think we need to go further and make those def the definitions even stricter, but I think that will do a very good help. Then another point that I think is really, really important is that the papers show the importance of the long term. Look at the papers about Sri Lanka and Chile and how when you actually bring in the longer term, you can see the interaction 
between the potters and their work and how that changes, how they find alternatives, shortcuts, tools to facilitate the work. And in that, something that I particularly find very important is the interaction between solutions and problems. Solutions, no matter what, lead to problems. And those, again, lead to solutions. And that also plays into the whole idea of unintended consequences of particular solutions that are being implemented. And I think that interaction is actually what drives the evolution of ceramic systems and therefore needs to be really taken as a very important part in our descriptions. And then whatever the starting point is, that fact of changes affects the whole system. As I see in the two cases that I have here in Sri Lanka and Chile, one can begin to see how that changes the society, how that changes the use of the environment, how that changes the family structure and the labor structure, how it changes institutions, for example, by the establishment of cooperatives and so on and so forth. All those things need to be brought in much more deeply in good ceramic analysis. And then last of all, I want to be very, very clear that short-term observation, let's punctual observation within a year or two, does not capture that kind of a dynamic. And that is a major challenge in ceramic studies. We need to study specific ceramic systems over much longer periods. Another thing that we need to do is we need to bring the community and the context closer together. Much is driven by community interaction or its absence. We see that in several of the papers that I've seen. And I want to give one other example that I've always really, really liked, and which is the question of innovation in kilns in Los Pueblos, an area in Mexico, not very far from Mexico City. Uh, what is happening there is that at some point, that for a long time, one single pottery trader controlled the whole system by simply saying, okay, uh, if you make more pots, I pay less for them. And so keeping these people in place. When he dies, a whole bunch of people start competing for being the most important trader. And that opens up the system and creates all kinds of innovations. People start buying trucks and trading their ceramics much farther afield. People start building different kinds of kilns. And what is very interesting to observe is that in the period in which that sort of happens, people start experimenting with very different kilns. But because in that area, each pottery workshop is surrounded by a high wall, people cannot see what their colleagues or competitors, whatever you want to call them, actually do. And so it turns out that in the end, the fact that there is one house that is two stories and that therefore can look into the wall, over the wall of the next neighbor and see how that neighbor produces pots, in the end introduces a new uh, model of kiln that is taken up everywhere because the secret has escaped. Things like that are important things to actually take into account. And in particular, the socioeconomic, environmental and communication context is again coming up in all these examples. The, the go role of government policies, the role of adjacent non-potting communities where people can start selling pots, the importance of cooperatives for marking, but also for innovation and for getting a better deal. One of the examples where I have studied that is in the Philippines, in Negros Oriental, where on the one half island, because the island there is divided by a mountain range into two parts, we see a whole set of evolutions of exactly the same basic conceptual tradition uh, from very simple uh, handmade pots uh, with um, a, a hammer and anvil to pots that are made on what is the equivalent of a wheel. But what is interesting is that that leads to different organization of the workshop, differences in production, differences in products also. And in one of the interesting things is that you can there 
measure the isolation of individual settlements by looking at the means of transport. Uh, by the time you actually get motorized transport, that means that this, the places where pottery are be, is being made are actually part of sort of a city. In the rural areas, they have a very different and much simpler ways of transporting things. And that relates directly to communication. If you have these kinds of means of transport, people visit each other more and therefore innovation can actually become quicker and more important. Then on the technology, I think a general conceptual model of pottery making is essential. I arrived at that myself by comparing many different traditions and focusing on the challenges to be faced by the potters. I gave you the result of that in my talk last Tuesday night. But I think having that general model of the various challenges and affordances that a, any pottery making tradition actually must have is an important part of coming to a reasonable, coherent description of what is actually going on. And in part, as part of that, the detailed, much more detailed descriptions of chaîne opératoire are essential for understanding the system. And I miss those a lot, uh, either completely, or they are sort of done in very general terms and not really detailed terms that articulate the vision of the potter and his technique with the actual uh, natural environment and, and social environment in which the potter is working. And in that proceeding, what need, one needs to do is to focus on the interface between the reality of the economy and material organization and the potter's perspective and its biases. So that comes to a very interesting point. What we have, and I have studied cases of that, both in, in Mexico and also in Holland, is how people adapt indigenous techniques to shapes that are being created on the wheel. And in one particular case, a really interesting one in the Philippines again, I met a potter, a man, actually the only male potter on the whole island for other reasons. He was sort of ejected from his own community on another island because he was homosexual. Uh, you actually get him to be subject to a pottery making demonstration on a modern throwing wheel. And he then gets himself a wheel but complains to me that he cannot make anything on it. Well, that's rather logical because in the normal tradition in which he works and everybody else on the island works, there is, you start your pot with the rim and on the potter's wheel, you actually have to start it with the bottom, but that never <laughs> got considered. And so he has the wheel in his garden and he cannot do very much with it. And so, Another thing that I found really, really interesting, but that has incredible ramifications for our whole scientific procedure is the suggestion that we should focus on ruptures and we should not focus on continuities. Uh, and that's interesting because our whole scientific tradition from the 17th century focuses on entities, stability and progress. And if you invert that, and I'll talk in a moment about how to do that, that gives very different perspectives. Even though we focus particularly on entities and stability, we do include progress, but we do it, and that's very manifest in archeology span actually, we do it with a sort of staircase model. We have flat areas, which everything is stable, and then suddenly it changes and we get to a new flat area where everything is stable. That is definitely not the way this would be looked at, for example, in China. And it's interesting to put that back into the origins of the Western scientific tradition, because we follow the kind of logic that Aristotle uh, developed in Greece. But we do that against not in any way taking into account the work of another very important Greek philosopher, Heraclitus of Ephesus. He basically argues that everything always changes and that therefore 
stability is something that is actually created by people. If you do that, you actually come to basically a complex systems approach because what you're beginning to look at is the unexpected changes, the emergence of novelty, as for example, uh, Taleb uh, argues in his Black Swan book. So you get an inversion between what is dominant, is stability dominant or is change dominant? And if you start looking at that from that perspective, you begin to see a whole area of things that we haven't really looked at in our scientific approach. And that is which mechanisms ensure stability. If you assume change because of this idea of that solutions create problems, create solutions, create problems, which basically argues that you see change through time, no matter what, then the question is, well, what for certain periods creates stability? And I think that would be a very interesting question, not only for ceramics, but also for environmental science and others. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to the discussion.